1951, a young man aged 17 took part in a school field trip along the Settle and Carlisle line. So struck was he that, in the years that followed, he returned there many times, camera in hand, to film scenes such as these. A small part of a love affair that finally ended on the 27th of April 2004, when David Jenkinson died, aged 69. David was once described as a man with his head in the clouds and his feet firmly on the ground. Whether or not the clouds were made of steam, there's no doubt that he was a visionary who dared to dream, and also a realist in touch with the practical world. But the description also evokes another image, that of a giant. He was regarded as a giant in the hobby, a person of tremendous knowledge, a man who influenced the hobby in a very dramatic and, and forceful way. My interest in railways goes right back to the time when I was a child and we used to travel home to, to the north of England from south of London. Uh, we lived on the old Southern Railway in those days. and. Uh, when we came north um, to see the, the, the grandparents, um, we nearly always went by the LMS route because my dad said the carriages were more comfortable and it was less crowded than the one from King's Cross. And that's when I first encountered red engines and red trains. And I thought these are vastly superior to the green ones that trundled past my backyard. So that's where it started. And uh, from then onwards, I just gradually developed an interest in, in, in that railway, which was the LMS in my youth. But of course, that bit of it had belonged to the Midland. David owed much of his early interest, and indeed his skill, to his father. My dad was a, a very fine modeler, and he taught me how to use tools as early as six years old. I remember building a model aeroplane when I was only six, and we actually got it to fly. Um, and then after uh, the war, when my father came home to live with us again, after he'd been away much of the war, he started fiddling around in the workshop again, and I decided I was going to build model railways. It was in 1963 that David started to make his first real impact upon the hobby. I met David for the first time in September 1963. About nine of us had gathered together. The object was to see if we could form a society. And within half an hour, the LMS Society was in being. We talked to the editors of a number of magazines, but the most responsive was Cyril Freezer of the Railway Modeler. And he was enthusiastic when we suggested that could we have a complete issue of a magazine to be devoted to the LMS. And he offered us either June or May 1964, and we chose June, because it gave us an extra four weeks to get the material ready. David and Bob's involvement in the LMS Society was the start of a lifelong friendship, but it was also a catalyst for something else. He came to see me one evening. I was busily painting and applying the livery to an 044 tank, which was required for one of the articles in the 1964 Railway Modeler Special Edition. And in what I later realised was pure Jenkinson style, he removed his pipe from his mouth when I showed it to him and said, what do you think? And said, it looked better before you put the letters on. He was quite right. I protested in vain that they were the only transfers that were available. And I knew they were the wrong shape. He knew they were the wrong shape, but there was nothing else. About three large whiskies later, we decided that if we were going to get the right transfers and persuade a manufacturer to produce them for us, we had better find out what the LMS did as far as the livery of its locomotives, carriages and wagons were concerned. And thus David and I embarked upon a partnership which lasted until he died and included 16 books in joint authorship 
and a 17th book uh, written in conjunction with another LMS Society member. My role was largely that of the ferret, while David uh, did the writing and the analysis. One of the first problems faced by the fledgling LMS Society was gathering enough material to fill the June 1964 issue of Railway Modeler. We needed a layout for Railway of the Month, and the only person who had one was David, but nobody had seen it. So two of us, Don Field and I, decided we ought to inspect Marthwaite. Uh, we told him that uh, not all the signals worked, that it hadn't got any ballast. Nevertheless, it, uh, it didn't stop him because uh, Marthwaite won the Railway Modeler Cup and David won the Modeler Cup on at least two or three other occasions. It was uh, a little terminus to fiddle yard system um, and uh, that was exhibited tw two or three times in the north of England. It was described two or three times in Railway Modeler. And then when uh, the RAF moved me on to the next uh, on the next posting, it wouldn't fit the new married accommodation. So I parted with Marthwaite to a friend of mine and I built a small continuous one which we called Garsdale Road. The uh, best layout, this is my own personal opinion, that he ever produced, his finest work, was Garsdale Road. And we took Garsdale Road to uh, a number of places but the most outstanding was Central Hall in the early 1970s. When I finally left the RAF in 1972, I, I bought a, a house with a reasonable garden and I put a big shed into it and built a huge four mil scale layout. At just over 35 by 16 feet, Little Long Drag must be one of the most ambitious solo efforts ever attempted. Jenks would always put a quart into a pint pot, preferably a half pint pot if he could get away with it. And in a way, this reflected with some of his models. It worked perfectly. Trouble is, it needed eight people to run it. Um, and I could f couldn't really face the idea of 300 new wagons and dozens of new carriages and heaven knows how many engines. So it suddenly lost its interest. And uh, I stripped it all out, sold off most of the models and started again in 7 mil scale. The result was Candle which had been perfected into its third version by the time of David's death. I started in 7mm scale because I'd been asked to make men some models for some friends and I suddenly realised that they had a whole, whole different characteristic. They were more massive, uh, their rolling quality was, was much more like the prototype and I realised that in the space I'd got I could build a manageable 7mm scale layout in the space where the 4mm one was beginning to get a bit too large. It was around this time that David also became involved in an even larger scale. He joined the National Railway Museum as Head of Education and Research. One of his many achievements at the museum was securing the restoration of Duchess of Hamilton. He began by contacting Bob Essery, who at the time was attending a trade exhibition on behalf of his employer. It was a quiet day and across the aisle there was another company promoting the use of paintings for promotional purposes. So I called David and said, how about getting somebody to paint a picture of a train and then we sell it as a limited edition? Who could we get? I said, well, I don't know, but I go and ask these people if they know Cuneo. So before the day was out, the deal was stitched up, and there it is. That's one of the 750. But that was only part of the cash that we raised. The rest of it came from a stroke that David pulled. He then got the Friends of the National Railway Museum to write a blank check for the difference between what we raised with the picture and what was needed. And as a result, a year or so later, Duchess of Hamilton was in steam, uh, David had got a train of carriages, they were mostly dining cars and restaurant vehicles and kitchen cars with lots and lots of bottles of red wine in them, um, running about England. David had a huge impact on the work of the National Railway Museum, but it, in turn, also influenced him. David wrote, 
During my museum life, I had developed a much wider interest in and appreciation of the non-British aspects of railway history. During 1994 to 95, a Gauge 1 system took shape in David's garden, with the theme of Trains of All Nations. But at the time, something else was taking shape in David's mind. His plan for the third and final version of Kendall. When I started to build the 7 mil limb layouts, I decided to wind back the historical period to about the late 1920s, around about 1929-30, partly because I preferred the older-fashioned carriages, I enjoyed making them more. There is nobody that I've ever seen that could produce coaching stock as good as he did. I believe he learnt a lot from Gordon, the late Gordon Hayward, but he took Gordon Hayward's techniques to a, a much greater height, and his carriages are superb. And it's my deep regret that I don't have any of them, but then I didn't think it was going to go quite so quickly. I suppose I've developed a bit of a reputation for carriage building, but that was largely because the carriages I wanted weren't available commercially in kits or any other way. So I thought, all right, scratch build them. And I taught myself how to do that. I enjoy model making, but it can get very frustrating. And I, I much prefer it when the model is finished and I can actually put it to use on the model railway. These trains are accurate miniatures of reality. And really what he wanted was somewhere to run them. And it didn't matter too much where it was. Uh, electrified line out of uh, London, I think he would have still have found a reason to put his Royal Scot down it, but um, that was David. If ever they write the history of this hobby and they start by saying, well, who had the most influence? At the top of the tree, one of the names is going to be David Jenkinson.